Welcome back, everyone, to another Kaiserreich guide, or, uh, yeah, whatever you want to call it. Uh, this time we're going to take a look at Australasia, the Australasian Confederation. Now, of course, uh, the Australasian Confederation is essentially made up of uh, our timelines, Australia plus New Zealand, and essentially all of the uh, British colonies in the like South Pacific. So you have your Fiji, well at least those weren't taken by Germany, uh, at least not those, uh, but yeah you have your Fiji, you have your uh, New Guinea or Southern New Guinea with um, of course Port Moresby. And uh, they are essentially the Entente's kind of uh, Pacific country. So that is um, you know the basics and what comes along with it is that it's kind of a uh, country that's a little bit focused on uh, the navy and the military side of things but it does also have some other things going for it now uh, taking a look at the focus tree I'm gonna do the least interesting parts first you have a army stuff of course that's kind of based on uh, the Anzac of course so the Anzac are the um, Australian and New Zealand expeditionary forces that fought in World War I, as probably you all know, mostly fighting, well, mostly famously fighting in the Gallipoli operation here around this part of the Ottoman Empire, and then in Western uh, Europe and the Western Front as well. Of course, they lost, so uh, considering that conscription was very unpopular in Australia and New Zealand, as was in Canada in uh, real life and of course that they lost the war as well you have some pretty bad penalties to your war fighting and your recruitable population all of that because of course people don't really want to get in themselves involved in more of these adventures for someone else uh, that being the british empire but you also have the anzac spirit because you know uh you're like the most uh i guess you could say these troops are famous for being the most aggressive and the most uh the ones with the highest morale and fighting spirit. So you're going to be dealing with uh, the Anzac and how you're going to uh, want to specif uh, specialize them. So you get this event, this clarifying the Anzac doctrine, uh, where you have different options on how to modify this uh, Anzac spirit, and you can get your army to be pretty strong that way. Uh, then you can focus on quality or mobility. Uh, which uh, does give quite a few very strong bonuses, uh, especially you can get a Z special elite unit, uh, that is a like elite uh, special forces. You can get mountain infantry, and then you can get some bonuses either for urban combat or for jungles. Jungles is uh, very useful actually, because you do have quite a lot of jungles in your neighborhood, in the East Indies, and in uh, Siam. So you can make quite good use of those. Uh, and then you can either focus on defense or enact the Anderson Doctrine. The Anderson Doctrine is, uh, well, I might show it to you later. It's something where you get like a bunch of decisions in here uh, to get claims on a lot of territories, a lot of territories, especially the ones that are part of Deutsch Ostasien. And the whole idea is that Australia or Australasia should be reclaiming uh, a bunch of lost British territories. So, uh, well, both lost British territories and uh, take... German ones, so especially some in the South Pacific. This is, I believe, supposed to be New Caledonia, uh, and it's now New Elsass. Uh, you can get claims on a bunch of these islands. You can get claims on uh, northern Papua New Guinea. You can get claims on northern Borneo, and of course, to reclaim Singapore and Malaya. So these are all things that do, uh, you know, do exist, but it's only claims. It's not actually anything uh, that allows you to actually have. Uh, the things without declaring war on Deutsch Ostasien, which uh, is to say declaring war on the Reichspakt and bringing in the German Empire. Very slight Air Force tree, nothing interesting. Uh, then the Royal Navy one is actually very, very interesting and very cool, uh, because essentially what uh, what you are is, um, what the situation that you're in is that a bunch of British ships, when of course they lost the British Isles, were stationed in Singapore. So um, Singapore was occupied by Germany and then 
the rest of those ships, uh, the, Easy the Asiatic Fleet, or well, actually, actually that was the American name, the East Asian Fleet, uh, then ran away to Australia. And so you have some of them in active, active service, uh, these ones, uh, especially the two battleships, Malaya and Royal Sovereign, and then the HMS Hood. Yes, you have that one. You have the Repulse, who in uh, real life was famously sunk, trying to defend Singapore from the Japanese, and the, uh, you know, the sinking of Force Z. Then you have the Frobisher, the Emingham, and the Brisbane cruisers. And, you know, a bunch of uh, smaller ships that are historically part of the Australian Navy. Because historically, the Australian Navy was more like a um, territorial defense force. Whereas here, you even have a carrier, the HMS Albatross, um, which is actually supposed to be a seaplane carrier. Uh, but it is represented as a pre Veld Creek carrier with 10 uh, planes that it can carry and again you have a lot of very very powerful dreadnoughts from the British arsenal uh, from of course Queen Elizabeth and uh, revenge classes and a bunch of you know the hood of course very famously is in there as well so um, you can either choose for the state of the RAN uh, because you have so many ships uh, both in active service and in mothball um, that you aren't supposed to have, your fleet is oversized, and so you have some uh, costs that come with this. And with the state of the REN, you are going to do a lot of things to um, you're, you're going to do a lot of things to sort of uh, prevent these costs from being too grievous, and then that gets rid of oversized fleet, and then you still have to uh, well kind of uh, address the question of the reserves. So are you going to uh, upgrade them and then get a massive fleet off of that? Or are you going to scrap the reserves and you're going to abandon the uh, mothball fleet, which is of course a more defensive outlook. And then you can get quite a lot of dockyards and um, bonuses to your navy. So Australasia's navy can get very, very powerful actually, which uh, in the, has some implications for what the country can do in the political uh, tree, but I'll get to that later. Then you have a lo little tree for research. Uh, you can get quite a lot of bonuses, so Australia can be strong on the research, and you can even get the nukes, of course. Uh, one of the options that you have open to you is the ISAC, the Imperial Scientific and Academic Council, which is like the uh, British, uh, rather Canadian, research faction. So you're going to get bonuses on what the other Entente members research, of course, that is if you're going with the Entente at all, or you can just expand your own Australasian Research Council, which has some uh, bonuses of its own. And um, yeah, then you have the economy. It's just it's actually pretty boring, except for these um, these two these two focuses. You can get trade deals with several different countries, and you're either going to be going for uh, seeking new markets or trading with the Commonwealth, and you actually have a lot of decisions that have to deal with Australia's and uh, New Zealand's mineral wealth. So, if you take a look down here, you have this exploit resources, which works kind of like in uh, standard Hearts of Iron 4, where you have resor uh, resource deposits that you haven't really tapped into yet, and so you can um, go ahead and spend some political power, spend some silly in factories for a bit, and you're going to get those resources. Australia is in a prime position to be very strong when it comes to uh, the economy and the resources, because you not only have quite a few to start off with, and you have your decisions to get new resources as well. Um, of course, very famously, Australia itself has uh, essentially like a lot of mining, a uh, very strong mining sector, and so makes a lot of sense. You're also very close to the resource base of the East Indies. So if you're going to be attacking the uh, German East Asia state, Siam, and the Netherlands uh, for the Dutch East Indies, you're going to be in a great little spot for resources. Then it is the most interesting part, in my opinion, the political tree. But first, I'm going to just take a very quick look, a very quick gander at the military itself. Uh, like you don't have that big of an air force uh, and this is actually kind of a problem you don't even start with that many techs for it well you do start with some that is because you're you know this, these are like the british techs that you start with for canada uh, but you're of course relying on your navy a little bit which means that you're gonna have to research uh, naval bombers otherwise you're gonna be in deep shit uh, because your carriers are gonna be worthless so yeah that's uh, kind of important but uh, other than the Air Force, you do have, of course, quite the strong army to start off with um, for such a size of a nation. Um, 
And uh, the main problem with the starting army is that you're going to have a lot of cavalry divisions that you probably need to change uh, because, I mean, six cavalry, eh. And then you have free garrisons that, considering the amount of manpower that you have uh, being pretty low, probably best to change those as well. But the infantry is okay. Uh, they've got artillery to start off with. And uh, you can get quite a lot of bonuses for them. Uh, even, like, what I would advise is just going down to marines and getting a lot of marines because, of course, you're going to be doing a lot of naval invasioning. But that aside, uh, the economy is also pretty okay. You've got a lot of civvy factories, not a lot of militaries, and a few dockyards. But uh, you, can, um, you can make quite a good economic base. Again, because you have a lot of resources, you're going to be receiving a lot of civilian factories from other countries, especially depending on um, which side are you on. Uh, if you're going to stick with the Entente, uh, go with um, Japan, but that's another deal, or go with the International you're always gonna have clients for your uh, resources. So you're gonna get quite a lot of civilian factories to grow your economy. And then we get to the political part, which is very complicated actually, because it's not just like uh, going down focuses and uh, taking these paths, it's actually very, very complicated on how you get these. So the default one is the democratic Australasia. Now, the, uh, Australasia, right at the start, let's actually get the event for the history. Uh, because that's going to explain a little bit more. So you're a confederation, right? And uh, you are essentially under martial law because what happens is after uh, Britain falls apart, you're, you get, of course, all these territories and uh, every, like all the resources of Australia are strained at this point and uh, there's uh, malcontent and there is an uprising in Melbourne. Uh, my Australian geography is severely lacking. That's Brisbane. Melbourne is down here. Uh, called the Melbourne Commune, of course, a bunch of uh, a bunch of syndicalists, a bunch of communists try to take over the city and uh, proclaim a republic. Uh, blah blah blah. You know how it goes. It was completely uh, crushed with military force, and um, at that point, essentially, um, you have the installation of martial law, and the governor general becomes this guy, William Birdwood, who I believe is like a Australian general from World War One or something like that. And, um, well, uh, at this point, uh, that's, that's it. Like, you're just stuck in this kind of limbo. And uh, you are, you know, not, like, you're a democracy in name, but not really. Uh, and then what ends up happening is that you're going to have to reinstate elections in 1936 because of a, sort of a factional struggle. And, uh, well, of course, this guy is gone, he's out, and uh, you're gonna have different choices. Now, let's jump to 1936. Of course, I've got a lot of saves prepared so that I can show you. So you're gonna get the event for the elections somewhere in the middle of 1936, and uh, in there, you actually have three choices, all of whom are democratic. Uh, you can either have the liberals, the country party, for Earl Page, and that's normal. Uh, you can have the United Australasia Party, Stanley Bruce, those are the conservatives. They actually increase your stability a little bit, which is needed because you don't have a lot of it. And then you have John Curtin and the Australasia Labour Party, uh, who actually are gonna be the ones who maybe go down the victory for the syndicalists. Because if we take a look at this, we start off and um, Essentially, there's two factions within the Labour Party. One of them is the, of course, reformist social democratic one. And then the other one that can happen is that you can either, so you're gonna have this event, you can either expel the revolutionaries from the party and you're gonna stay social democratic until the uh, 1939 elections. So you're gonna stay, stick to the left-hand side of the path, or you can choose the ACTU seizes control. So the ACTU is the Australasian Council of the Trade Unions, and you're gonna become a syndicalist. You uh, have a white piece of all the wars that the Entente is fighting, and then you are, you are a syndicalist. Of course, uh, kind of funny because I was privatizing the public sector. So yeah, syndicalist doing that. And then from here, um, you have a syndicalist government and you can go down this uh, path. And uh, from there, you can either be syndicalist or totalist, but th there's not that big of a difference. 
and uh, you can also purge the army because of course uh, one problem that comes from the syndicalist path is that New Zealand is gonna break free under a uh, military government and try to um, try to essentially call in the Entente to help and uh, you know get the hell out you can get it back relatively easily because again uh, as I said earlier the Australasian uh, Navy can get very strong so if you rush down and upgrade the reserves and get those out uh, and then get a relatively strong like naval landing force to deal with New Zealand you can essentially beat <laughs> the Royal Navy uh, with your you know, Australasian Navy and then just take New Zealand and after you take New Zealand you get a peace treaty uh, with the rest of the Entente they're gonna leave you alone so that's something that you can do it's hard to do it in 1936 because of how early it is. Like, it takes a while for New Zealand to break free, but it is still relatively early. Another thing that you can do is that you can just wait for the 1939 elections and do the same. Um, I'll show it to you later. I'll just very, very quickly... Uh, may maybe is there a... Hold on. Yep, there is. Because uh, one thing that you can do... Okay, never mind. Uh, one thing that you can do is uh, once you've restored the syndicalists, you're going to have a coup from a faction called the Australasian Guard, who are the Nat Pops. And uh, actually, this is, uh, this is not even with the syndicalists. This is with um, the Social Democrats, because in 1939, if the Social Democrats win then uh, the Australasian Guard can coup you, even if you're just a social, social democrat and not a syndicalist. Uh, it depends on your choices, uh, but yeah. Uh, so you can either have the coup fails and you stay whatever you are. So if you're syndicalist, you're going to stay syndicalist. Uh, or if you are going to choose the coup succeeds, you're going to become this guy, Thomas Blamey, who's actually your field marshal, your better one. And uh, from there, you can go down the victory for the guard path in the National Focus Stream. Which we're going to take a look at later. We're going to take a look at all of the uh, paths, what they entail. Uh, then the last one is the AFM. So essentially, uh, what I was saying earlier with um, how the 1936 elections can go. If we go down. If you choose either the Labour Party and expel the revolutionaries, or if you choose anyone else you are going to stay democratic for three more years. Da -da -da. Yes, yes, please. So let's choose the United Australasian, maybe. And, uh, yeah, they're like, okay, whatever, the Australasian Guard. You're going to get a lot of events, by the way. There's a lot of events for this country, and it's done very well. Uh, and uh, you're going to be staying democratic for three years, but you can't actually take the focus is from this line downwards. The only things that you can do is you can reinstate freedom of the press, lift martial law, and then uh, deal with the unions. Uh, if you have cho if you have chosen, if you have chosen, um, if you have chosen the social democrats, you cannot suppress them. But if you have chosen the, uh, how can you be authoritarian democrat? Right, there is a way. So if you're a authoritarian democrat, you of course cannot compromise them. Uh, we'll take a, uh, we'll look at the uh, way you can be a authoritarian democrat later, uh, and essentially stay with the national party. There is a way, but yeah, you, you cannot go down further than this. Uh, you cannot take the Maori Act. You cannot take the uh, labor threat being over. You cannot take call for unity. None of these. That is because you need the 1939 election for that to go down. And this is supposed to give you a little bit more time to prepare for whatever you want to do if you're going to take these other paths uh, with a relatively stable uh, base because you can get a lot of stability through these focuses. Uh, so for the governor general, essentially the governor general is like kind of like the head of state. And right now you have chosen a conservative cabinet head by Bruce. Uh, but you have three different options. You can either have, uh, you can stay with Birdwood, who's not that popular, so you're going to lose stability. You can say, uh, I'm going to have an Australasian governor general, or you can invite a member of the royal family to hold the post, and the member of the royal family would actually be uh, George. Um, George, the brother, uh, I believe brother, right, of uh, Edward VII, and uh, the one who in real life becomes the king of uh, 
Great Britain uh, and uh, you know during World War Two, blah blah blah, all that famous stuff. So yeah, that that George that in real life becomes George the Sixth. If you have the Australasian Governor General, you get Isaac Isaacs. And I'm not sure who he is, but his name is Hilarious. And uh, his portrait looks kind of interesting. So, uh, yeah, that's what he has going for it. And um, so, yeah, essentially, you go down to the 1939 elections. You uh, kind of say, ah, well, that's fine. We're going to stay democratic for a few years and get drawn into whatever the Entente is trying to do and grow your economy and uh, do whatever, like, responsible governments try to do. And so the 1939 general election comes in and you have four choices. Not just free. Uh, so the at this moment, the liberals merged with the conservatives, and they're just the United Australasia. It's one ticket. Uh, then you have the Labour Party, uh, John Curtin, and um, you can either again, if you choose the Australasia Labour Party in 1949. And by the way, this is uh, how it looks like if you have Prince George in uh, as the governor. And then yeah, again, you can take the uh, Labour Party, and then. If you don't want to get cooed, you can also become syndicalist. And uh, then you can either take the Center Party or the Australasia First Movement. The Center Party is essentially another game for the Guard. It's kind of like their, uh, I don't know, it's kind of like their brand <laughs> for the election. But the Guard is like the paramilitary organization, whereas the Center Party is the actual political party. Or you can take the FM, the Australasia First Movement who are also, uh, well, they're represented as extreme right-wing paternal autocrats, but they're not really that much. It's kind of like uh, there was nothing else for them to be. Uh, they're just kind of independentist from the Entente. They are kind of isolationist. And, uh, well, at the same time, they have a kind of socially and economically, well, economically uh, interventionist and... Um, Kind of like state management, they do like that. So not re not very laissez-faire from them. And uh, also they've got kind of a social policy of uh, uniting Australasia and ending the white Australia policy, uh, which I'll explain later. So uh, they're like, they're technically right-wing, but they're not really that right-wing. They're more like, uh, they're more like, I don't know, they're Stalinist. <laughs> that, that's that's kind of what they are. Like they want to cut ties with the Entente. They want to an, essentially take control of the state economy, and they want to get some kind of social reform in. I don't know. They're very very weird. Like you can't really describe them in any way. Anyway, uh, so you have a lot of problems if you choose the more radical options. Uh, but even if you choose, again, even if you choose the Australian Labour Party at this point, you can still redo all the things that you could do in 1946. So you can have uh, the Australasian Guard coup as a reaction. If you go cynicalist, you can go cynicalist. You can have New Zealand break off of you. Uh, all of those things, you can still do them. It's kind of like a repeat of 1946 in that way. Or you can stay democratic and just have elections forever uh, and uh, go down this path. Or you can choose one of these two paths and, um, you know, you can have uh, the guard be there in two ways. You can either uh, just choose the center party right here and then you have the guard. Or, again, you can go syndicalist and then choose the guard. I don't know if you've changed your mind or if you want to, like, uh, I don't know, if you want to, like, make up a story or whatever. That's, uh, yeah, the whole way the, whole way the political structure is structured, uh, the political paths are structured, it's uh, very much conducive to, I guess, narrative things, because you can have, like, coups and counter coups, and it's all very nice. Anyway, uh, if we go down back again to, da -da -da, to 1949 elections, I'll just show you what happens if the uh, AFM takes over. So that you can see it. Da, da, da. The Australasia First Movement. So the Australasia First Movement changes the flag actually and uh, changes your name to the Republic of Australasia because you're technically, uh, you've said, you, you've gotten rid of the crown, right? Uh, you, you're not a kingdom anymore under Edward or whatever he is. Uh, you're a free and independent republic. You're still part of the Entente. You need to uh, complete cut ties with the crown to get out of the Entente. 
And again, there's like a lot of themes of uh, like never again Gallipoli, all of that, because you're supposed to be a strong, independent uh, black <laughs> Australasian who takes uh, no shit from the British. So yeah, just in general, you suspend elections, you're kind of like a dick bag in a way. Uh, it's kind of totalitarian actually, but then you get down to uh, either just completely being on their own, or you can even tie yourself to Japan. Unfortunately, you don't actually join the co-prosperity sphere, which is sad. Also, what the hell does it say? Oh, because Japan needs to not be totalist. Okay, that, that makes sense. Okay, see, I thought that it meant uh, Australasia is... Uh, <laughs> Australasia is not totalist. Uh, I'm like, how can you go down this path if you're a totalist? And you can also purge the army, because of course... Purging the army is always pretty great. Um, both this one and for the syndicalist, it takes about six months, and the penalty then gets replaced with a bonus because you have new, your new loyal officers, and you have new officers as well. Like, you're going to get new generals, and um, they're usually not that good. They're worse than what you start off with, but they're pretty okay. And yeah, that's the AFM. The syndicalists are, of course, all about empowering the working class, all of that, blah, blah, blah. You've seen this 10 times, a million times before. Uh, although um, Australia is kind of derpy in that. Um, it, it's funny because normally it's like the totalists that have the secret police and all that, but it's actually the <laughs> syndicalists that have the secret police in this one. Whereas the totalists are more about like uh, total economic control and then mobilization so you get a little bit more manpower and free militia units that you cannot delete which is annoying as hell but at least those you can use as like garrisons or something uh, and uh, you actually it's actually pretty strong when it comes to the economy because you get some free factories and um, you know uh, it's kind of okay you can get some bonuses of course if you're DFM to the economy as well uh, for the guard, it's more about like being the most entente that you can be. So if you're democratic, you're still gonna stay in the entente. But if you take victory for the guard, you are like such a just British fanboy. It's not even funny. So you're gonna have Canadian advisors. You're gonna be a free market economy. Uh, you're gonna have loyal officers and. Uh, then the choice is either are you gonna be a total bitch or are you gonna be a strong bitch for how your role in the empire is supposed to be because of course Australasia is the role in the British sort of Entente uh, coalition is that they're supposed to be the ones defending the Pacific and uh, you know wait how the what the fuck what how is this possible how did they form the syndicalist? How the hell did they form the syndicalist union without? Um, wait, no, never mind. I thought that you needed to be united to have that one. No, like, how the hell? I don't know, man. The AI sometimes is just such a. How did they do that without? taking Burma in as a alliance because usually that's the only way that they form the syndicalist union but here they formed it oh right the Philippines that's how it happened <laughs> that's hilarious so because of that Indonesia could actually join the syndicalist union with um, with the rising dragon ha huh. well that's great it's funny as hell, though, because like normally you cannot ever do that. Anyway, so uh, if you're uh, the AFM, you're kind of independent slash you're doing your, you're doing your own thing. With the guard, you're just such a bitch, um, and uh, yeah, you're just a nat pop who is part of the Entente. So you're kind of like um, you're kind of like a you're kind of like a wasp Portugal, you know, uh, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant Portugal. I don't know, like. Um, yeah, once again, Canada betraying democracy or whatever. And uh, you're just trying to help them out. Being a loyal little bitch. And if you're democratic, uh, you do democratic things. But one thing you can do is that you can form a Australasian Republic. And uh, you're still staying part of the Entente. But um, yeah, you, you can become an Australian Republic. Although, hold on. 
let us go back to the elections just in case there's something to that event that I missed because I haven't played extensively all the paths so I don't exactly know how that works let's just like, stay with the United Australasia party thank you very much and um, probably no terrible events are gonna happen god damn it this uh yeah, this is a particularly derpy game uh, right now that's going on, so that's why it's going to be very slow. And so, as you can see, you're in a pretty good spot. You're in a pretty good spot. And, um, oh, so I can show you actually a few more things. I'll just take, like, uh, focus dot. What the hell? I guess my, oh, right, my keyboard is in Russian right now. Sorry. Didn't have the keyboard in English. Focus dot autocomplete. Okay. So now, the Maori Act. So this is essentially about like uh, the treatment of the natives in New Zealand, and uh, you can either say this lands, these lands can be used, and you're gonna get more building slots. Uh, although it's, you know, pretty bad to your poly power, or just the Maori Act, like that. And then, all right, I need this one, and I need this one. Become a republic. Okay, okay. Let's see. I've still got this guy. Anyway, uh, I've actually got autocomplete on, so the AI is gonna be pretty much mashing a bunch of- Oh! Oh, I didn't know! Oh, okay. So even if you take the Republic, you can have a coup. Wow, I'm conservative. And of course, if you uh, take the coup fails, then the Australasian guard is gonna be outlawed and all that. So what I wanted to also show you is the upgrade reserves, because you get some events for that. Actually, I'll just remove this one. So that no stupid things happen. Of course, Japan capitulated Ching. Oh, God. Now it's going to lag the game because I took all of those things. Anyway, this is just lions. Don't care. The crown sever ties. Oh. Huh. So while the crown has given us assent to repatriate the Australasian constitution, they have also ejected us from the British alliance. Oh, okay. Oops. Stating that any colony so willing to abandon the empire cannot pr expect its protection, nor be expected to come to its aid. Uh, some Australasian politicians felt this response to be almost childish, but the matter is done. Never again we will be subject to British control. Huh. Well, never mind it. Oh. You look awesome, my friend. And you'll actually have the, uh, the independent Republic of Australasia flag. So actually, you're a little bit more like the AFM. Huh. I wonder if you can go, like, go down the entire focus tree or something, and then in the next election, take the AFM or something? Who knows? Who knows? Because, of course, um, you actually have elections every three years with uh, Australasia. Yeah, so you, you probably surmised this from 1946 to 1949, but, like, there's, uh, there's a whole bunch of... Um, there's a whole bunch of, like... I don't know, events that explain all of this, but yeah, you... Okay, so bye-bye, Australasian Guard, and uh, of course the leader, Blamey, he's gone. Leaving the ISAC, because you're not in the Entente anymore, so I guess this kind of shows what happens when you leave the Entente as well. So now you're just kind of alone. You're the Republic of Australasia. Oh, you're sad. And fine. But damn, this leader looks awesome! Okay, so th there's like a very, very good reason to be... Your own independent republic. If you're Stanley Bruce, you're cool. Wait, what? Oh, right. Come on, I just wanted uh, the, I just wanted the events to pop up for the upgrade the reserves. But like, you can probably guess what happens. Like, you just get events and uh, ships spawn. Uh, and of course, the other option is to just say, "Long live the king," and you're just gonna stay part of the Commonwealth. 
So I guess uh, that's about it. Of course, uh, if you're not in the Entente, this precludes a lot of uh, Entente relating focuses such as the Isaac. Well, a lot. Mostly that one. Mostly that one. And um, yeah, what's kind of funny is that the British don't tell you to return their ships. So you have your great, strong, awesome Navy for free. And uh, yeah, it doesn't seem like there's any other events except the guard queue for just the uh, creating the new republic so yeah that's gonna be about it uh, of course if you're a sent bus you can join the international and do your own thing but only if the um actually no never mind that was sorry sorry never mind uh, i was thinking of um indochina who can only join the international if uh, you're at war if you're at war if the british are at war with uh, or if the french are at war with the germans and uh, I find that that's a little bit stupid, but hey, that's how it works. And um, yeah, that's about it. I don't think there's anything else to cutter, cover. If I've missed something, well, tell me. <laughs> so I want to thank you all for watching. Hope you've enjoyed the Australasia breakdown. And uh, yeah, I'll see you soon.